When I was uh, 12 years old, my goal was to be an NFL quarterback. Now, it was sort of a lofty hope at that time uh, because, in fact, I didn't play football or practice football until I was 12 years old. I touched a football three months before I'm trying out. But I practiced as much as I could, but I determined that I was going to impress the coaches with my positive attitude. And I did. And they were really impressed with my positive attitude, so much so that when we had the first scrimmage game, they told me, be one of the return men. And I was excited. So here I am. I'm the one standing on about the five-yard line. My teammate's about 15-yard line. Now, we're 12 years old, so he's not going to kick it out of the end zone like Will Lutz. So he kicked the ball, and my teammate gets it about the 15, and I'm trailing that play. And everybody comes to my poor teammate. They tackle the guy. Then all of a sudden, out of that pile of gridiron warriors, the ball pops out. Ba-boom, 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 right into my hands at full speed. I look ahead of me and went like, oh, wow. There's nobody ahead of me. I'm going to score a touchdown. So I started running for my life. And I'm thinking, you know what this means? This means college scholarship. Yeah, definitely college scholarship. We're in a little bit more and went like, first time I touched the ball, a touchdown. This means Heisman Trophy. Yeah. So we're in a little bit more and I went, no, don't forget about that. That's his first round draft pick NFL. I got it made. I'm running a little bit more and I'm thinking, what's that in the corner of my eye? Uh-oh. Someone's trying to catch up to me. They're going to tackle me. I'm going to get hurt. <laughs> I'm going to lose my teeth. I haven't been on my first date yet. I want to have teeth. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to play it safe. So I did a quarterback slide and went down and ended the play. <coughs> and when I got up, I noticed that the referee put the ball on the one yard line. I had ran all that distance, and I missed my goal by about that much. Well, one thing it showed me was this. When it comes to people, there's basically two types. The types that's going to make a difference, they're going to go the extra yard, and those who make, and those who say, what difference does it make? See, a lot of people fall into that second category. I did. Now, some of those people in that second category are the ones who are going to sit on the sideline and watch. Good play. Some are going to be like me. They're going to run with the hope, but as soon as they see some type of risk, they're going to say, I might get hurt, might lose something, I'm going to stop. And a lot of writers are like that too. But the thing is, if you want to make a difference with your words, if you want to write that book, the key is this, don't start it in front of a computer, and don't start it in front of a, a typewriter, start it on your knees. Because prayer is going to make that book great. And that's what a lot of people forget, that if you don't have God on your side, you're not going to be victorious as a writer. And that's the first step. The Bible says, I can do all things through him, Christ, who gives me strength. Now, once you have that spiritual foundation, what is the key to being a successful writer? And I say this, it takes value to be a champion, a champion writer. Now, what does value stand for? It stands for this acronym. Vision, attitude, love, understanding, and energy, five elements that you need to be a great writer. Albert Einstein says, try not to be a man, or in this case a writer of success, but rather try to become a man or writer of value. Think about that. Now, because of this, a group of us, and Tina's one of them, people who want to help writers, and we came together to form Joyful Life Publishing, and that's to help you add value to your work. Because without value, I can tell you, your book will be a dream. But when you have a foundation of Christ as your spiritual foundation and you have value, then you have a book. Let's take a look at the first one, vision. Vision is your purpose. All great destinations, all great accomplishments starts with the vision of where you are, what you want or what you seek, and also the vision of where you're going. So basically a vision sets the course, but that defines your mission. There's a difference between vision and mission. The vision is where you are, where you're going. The mission is how you get there. That's your path. So, I want to tell you a story about Joe. Now, Joe was, he was a young boy, and he realized, I want to be an attorney one day. And he says, I know in high school I'm going to have to, to work hard to do that because all goals take work. And he was a model student, honor student. 
He was class president one year. He was part of the wrestling team. He was part of the marching band and parade band. I mean, he was very, very active. And after four wonderful, fantastic years, he graduated and went on to college. Now, college he knew was going to be the next step to being an attorney with his, his pre-law degree. But he also realized that I love sports. I'm a competitor, so I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be the goalie on the intramural floor hockey team. Y'all familiar with floor hockey? Okay, it's played on. So he, so he was the goalie on this team. Now, a lot of people say, you know, and after that, he went to law school, graduated, and became a successful attorney. And people usually say, well, that's great and fantastic. What made him so special? Because I know a lot of attorneys, and these attorneys are athletes. They play instruments. So what made Joe different? Guess what? Joe was blind. Now, Joe, although he could not see with his eyes, he kept focus on his goal. Although he could not see the football field or the parade route, he marched forward. And although he could not see the puck, he stopped the obstacle from defeating him. We all know Stevie Wonder, right? Stevie Wonder says this, just because a man lacks the use of his eyes doesn't mean he lacks vision. But a lot of times writers lack vision. They have a dream, but dreams can be fantasy if they don't have a vision of who you are, where you want, and they don't have the value. So the first part is the V. So, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained, the Bible says. So I ask you, and I gave you some handouts you can write on if you want now or later, but do you have a vision? Do you have a vision of what you want to be as a writer? Do you have a vision of your book? Do you have a vision of how you're going to go about writing it? And do you have a defined mission? Now let's talk about mission. Like I said, the mission is the path, right? Think of the outline as your roadmap. So I think when you start writing a book, you should always have an outline. And that's the way I do it. Some people may differ. Now, on that outline, you have to have goals. Goals are like your landmarks. You know how when you go in some place, you're going to have a landmark here and there? That's your landmarks. And you need action items, which is going to be how to get there. Like, am I going to go from point A to point B? Am I going to do it by driving a car, walking, etc.? So you have to have that. And finally, success times. Now, success times are what I call deadlines. Because deadline sounds so negative, doesn't it? So, oh, I got to make that deadline. <laughs> How about making that success time? It's, it's a, just a play on words there. So think about this. Let's take a look at a realistic goal. It's an obtainable dream or, or objective of future prosperity, success, significance, or security. But here's an important thing. I think goals must be obtainable, measurable, accountable, motivational, and more than anything, Goals have to be written. All your goals must be written, and I'll tell you why. Back in 1979, they did a study of Harvard MBA students, and they found that 84% of those students interviewed for this survey did not have any defined goals. 13% of them had defined goals, but they were not written. But 3% had written goals. Well, 10 years later, they, they talked to the same group of uh, Harvard students that were now graduates, and they found that the 13% the that had defined goals but not written, guess what? They made twice as much as the other 84%. But think about this. The 3% that had written goals, they made 10 times as much as the <laughs> other 97%. So that shows the importance of having written goals. Now, do you have written goals? I'm seeing some people shake heads. That's pretty good because that's going to help you with your vision because goals are your landmarks on that success. So we all know Zig Ziglar. What you get by achieving your goals is not as important as what you become by achieving your goals. The process, the journey. Think about this. The Saints are having a wonderful season this year, correct? And it's more about the journey, isn't it? to see the whole process going on. I want him to win tomorrow. I want him to win in Atlanta, just to show the mayor. Yeah. But, but the thing is this, it's the joy, the ride. And sometimes we forget to enjoy the ride of life. So not only when you're writing your book, but in life as, as, in general, you need to enjoy the ride. So let's go to attitude. That's the next one, remember? V-A is now attitude. Have y'all heard, is the half glass? Is the glass half full or half empty, right? Guess what I say? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't, does it? What's more important is what's in that glass. Think about this. If, I, if you're thirsty and I hand you a glass of poison, are you all going to drink it? 
Nobody would drink it, right? You know why? It has no value for you. But if I give you half a glass of water or your, your favorite beverage, guess what you're going to do? You're going to thank me and drink it. So what's more important is not what's you know, how the amount of value, volume is in the glass, but how much or what is in that glass. Think about this. If your glass right now, as a writer or a person, has negative thoughts, defeated attitude, guess what? Break that glass before it breaks you. Or as I say, shatter your glass before it shatters your life, because it will. And more important, take what's good in your life. Take what's good, and take, even if you have to get a, a new cup, a new glass. As God says, you have to renew your mind. That's another word for getting a new glass. So if you're not moving along as you want as a writer, get a new glass. And make sure that you empower the good in your glass to make you and not break you. The Bible says don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you, give you a new glass, right, into a new person changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, and I'm saying in your book, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Billy Graham once said, we are three people. And let's, let's use that analogy as three writers, right? We're the writer who we think we are, the writer who others think we are, but more importantly, it's the writer that God knows we are. And that's why I start on your knees. Which brings us to this question. Do you have a positive attitude? Is your glass half full or half empty? Doesn't matter, but what's in your glass? Norman Vincent Peale said, if you want things to be different, perhaps, answer, the answer is to become different yourself. To me, that says, get another glass. Which brings us to love. This is passion. And this probably, is, to me, is the most important part of being a writer, finding the passion to write. Passion is the, gives life to our purpose. This is a vision, right? We have to have life to that vision. And passion has, is the heartbeat of a champion writer. Now, appropriately, L for love is in the middle of the word value, right? And so that should be the middle of everything that's important to us. Because if you don't have that love, that passion for what you're doing and the people you're doing it for, you will not be successful. Let me show you this little exercise here. We know the word compete, right? But think about this. Let's take that L for love and put it in the middle of compete, and what do you have? Because God completes us, and he completes us through love. So the step is, you, how passionate are you about writing? Is it a dream? Is it a fantasy? My dream of being a football player in the NFL was a fantasy. I mean, if, they were to, if you would see me play back then, even now, you'll say, there's one thing for certain, he's spastic. And that would be the truth. But I had a good heart and I had a good attitude, positive attitude. But the key was you need more than that. So how passionate are you? This is why probably the main focus of why we put together Joyful Life Publishing to ignite that passion. Because you have to find a fire as a writer. Because without that fire, you will not be able to go every single day and, and be committed to writing the words. We all know Steve Jobs. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. And think about this. This is the term that I came up with in one of my books, The Heart of the Champion. Steve Jobs was very successful. Now, he's not a Christian, but he had the heart of a champion. Think about that. We have the heart of the champion because the only champion we have mm -hmm. is Jesus Christ. So we have something more powerful on our side than any Apple computer. Think about that. So when we want to write our book, all we have to empower is the heart of the champion that's in within each of us. Now we come to understanding our proficiency. Understanding is the resource. Vision, source. Understanding resource. And this understanding is not only from the mind, but from the physical skill aspect too. So you not only have to be mentally charged up to be a writer, but you have to have the talent to do it too. Now, a lot of times we get confused between knowledge and wisdom. Let me tell you, this is a little story that I have, but it's about a, a physics professor. And this physics professor was brilliant. 
And he would go all across the, the East Coast from university to university giving his lecture on quantum physics. And he was driven there every time by his longtime chauffeur. Now the chauffeur, you would always sit in the back of the, the presentation every time. And one day while driving to the next lecture, the chauffeur says, hey, prof, you know, I've heard your speech so much, I can give it better than you. And this amused the professor. He said, you know what? We're about the same size. Let's do this today. Let's switch clothes. You give the presentation. I'll wear your chauffeur outfit, and I'll sit in the back row. And they said, sure enough, let's do it. And they did. And that chauffeur got up there, and he gave a brilliant, brilliant presentation, word for word. And as he was leaving the stage, something happened that never happened before. Someone said, excuse me, professor, I got a, I got a question. The wannabe professor stops and says, yes. Uh, when it comes to uh, the black hole, is the event horizon in direct proportion to the singularity? And the wannabe professor starts laughing. He says, oh my goodness, I can't believe you asked that question. The answer is so obvious, my chauffeur in the back will answer it. <laughs> You see, the chauffeur in the back, the professor, he had wisdom. The other one just had facts, knowledge. So when you're looking at someone to help you with your book, do you want someone who has knowledge to facts, mechanically writing you, are you helping you write mechanically with a one-size-fits-all program for everyone? Or do you want someone who has the wisdom to understand you? So to me, you need a value coach. And a value coach is going to help you provide correction and direction, identifies and monitors goals, ensures accountability. That's a very, very important one. Keeps you focused and motivated, ignites your passion for writing, and bring the team together. I think one thing that is certain with, uh, with this championship game tomorrow and the one in the um, American Football Conference is this. Four coaches are brilliant all four of them. And all four of them are deserving of to be champions. Unfortunately, only one can, so it's got to be the Saints. But anyway, you have to, I want to tell you, this is a little story that, that, that happened to me many, many years ago, and I think it's appropriate with the Super Bowl coming. This is actually a Super Bowl ticket from 1975. Now, these are prime tickets. These are 11 rows from the, from the field at 45-yard line. 20 bucks at old Tulane Stadium. Remember Tulane? How many of y'all remember Tulane Stadium? I liked it. I liked it. But anyway, the morning of the Super Bowl is happening. And my best friend at the time, John, calls me up and says, I got two tickets to the Super Bowl. You want to go? And we're like, how'd you get the tickets? Because even then they were rare. And he says, well, my dad, sidebar, John's dad played Major League Baseball. And in fact, two years he was a manager for Cleveland Indians and when I first knew him he was a third base coach for the new team Kansas City Royals and he was best friends with Bob Lemon. Well Bob Lemon at this time was a consultant manager consultant back and forth between him uh, and this other guy Billy Martin and and he was George Steinbrenner's, uh, George Steinbrenner's the owner of the Yankees top person. These are George Steinbrenner's tickets. Okay so now we're sitting at these prime tickets we're going in we're 19 years old and we're sitting there, 19 years old, and all of a sudden this guy behind us is calling every play before it happens. This is better than Chris Collingsworth. This is awesome. Okay, so the thing went on and on, and he kept doing every play. Now, just to give you a little focus, Terry Bradshaw, first Super Bowl. Tell you how long ago that was, <laughs> okay? Um, and they were against the Minnesota Vikings. But anyway, I, I, I finally turned around and, and, and I noticed that the guy behind me was Coach Don Shula, who just lost the week before to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I, and I turned to him and I said, Coach, um, you know everything before it happens. Like, why aren't you here? And he says this, which is really important. It's one thing to know what to do, but it's more important to get it done. I mean, that's a powerful statement. Yes, because a lot of times we know what to do, we just can't get it done. And a lot of coaches who, who are on the losing side of it says, well, we had a good game plan, right? Probably means that we didn't get it done. 
But success is not measured by just didn't get it done. It's getting it done. So if you want to be a writer, if you really have a commitment to write, the thing is to get it done. So who is your coach? You're not going to do this alone. Drew Brees is fabulous. In my opinion, if not the, one of the top two or three quarterbacks of all time. But what do you think would happen? No, wait, there you go, number one. But what would happen if he went on the field by himself? He would go, all right. okay, Rams, uh, let me hike the ball to myself. Uh, let me throw it to my, he can't, he has to have a team. And writers need a team too. So who is your team? Who is your coach? Who puts everything together? Who's going to say, it's not only to know what to be done, but to get it done? Who's going to help you get it done? That's why with Joyful Life Publishing, we've put together a championship team, in my opinion. We're going to have writing coaches for you, editors, graphic artists. We're going to give you the whole nine yards. And what we're going to do is allow you to pick what you need. And we'll talk more about that a little later. Now, the book's Bible says that plans go wrong for lack of advice, but many advisors bring success. So even the Bible says you can't do it on your own. Now we come up to this one, the energy. We talked about the value, vision, attitude, love, and now we have the last one, E, for energy. Energy is the force. Vision is the source. Understanding is the resource. But now we have to have the force. And this is critical if you want to write your book. Now remember, there's two types of people, those who make a difference and those who wonder what difference does it make. The ones that uh, want to make a difference have to start off with motivation, discipline, and perseverance. Now, I'm going to skip now to discipline just to say one thing. If you want to learn about discipline, the best book is Divine Discipline by Rhonda Harrington Kelly. Wonderful book published by Pelican. She's a wonderful lady. Her husband is now the president of the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, she was a speech. She wrote the book. I, and I'll tell you the story about this. When I was writing my first book, I was having a problem with a chapter on discipline. I really was. And that's because I went to Jesuit high school. And discipline is like, you better do that or else. So it was not a really loving discipline. It was almost like a forced discipline. It was like a military discipline. And I didn't want to do that in my book. And I was having problems. So I was sitting in church, and God said, go to the Baptist seminary. And I did. And I went there, and I'm, waiting, and I'm sitting here and say, where's, where's that burning bush? I'm here, God. And I'm looking around, waiting for some type of lightning strike or whatever, and nothing's happening. After about 15 minutes, I went like, I'm here, God. Where are you? I did what you told me. And all of a sudden, I looked straight ahead. You know how you look and you don't focus right in front of you? And I focused right in front of me, and guess what I saw? A book that said Divine Discipline. I went, wow. Took that book home, read it in one day. At that time, Rhonda was actually the speech therapist at Auctioner. I called her up, and she said, you can use anything in my book, and I'll help you. And, and I said, well, you know what? Pelican approved my, my preliminary thing in the book. Um, and she says, no problem. That's my publisher, too. It'll be perfect. <coughs> so excuse me. She had a, a show called um, Woman to Woman. And I was, the, I was on there like eight times. And I was the only male to go eight times. I don't know what that says. But uh, anyway, but she was a delight on that. So we only asked about this. We're going to come back to perseverance, but let's do this. What motivates you the most? What's going to get you out of the dream mode on your book and get it into a got it done book? The got it done mode. What? Think about this. Because if you don't know what's going to motivate you, then everything else is going to fall flat on its face. Because you need all five elements, don't you? You have to have the vision. You have to have the attitude. You have to have the love. You have to have the understanding. And you have to have the energy. Now let's talk about perseverance because a lot of people say, I have writer's block. Let me tell you about that. How many of y'all like chocolate chip cookies? Pretty much everybody, right? We can learn a lesson from chocolate chip cookies. You know what that lesson is? Think about it. How do you bake cookies? Put them in an the oven, right? It gets pretty hot in there, doesn't it? Think of that as being the heat of adversity. 
When you put those chocolate chip cookies dough in there, what happens? They rise to the occasion, don't they? Do we? Now, in that same oven, I mean, I used to watch my grandmother cook, and in that same oven, she would put French bread. And guess what happened to the French bread? It got hardened. She also put vegetables in it, and guess what happened to them? They wilted. She also put meatloaf in there, wonderful meatloaf, but guess what happened to the meatloaf? Shrank. So when you have to overcome adversity, you want to be like a chocolate cookie dough? Or do you want to shrink, wilt, or get hardened by it? Hardened people make excuses. What are your excuses that, oh, I got a dream to write a book, I'm going to do it. See, the, 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 the perseverance, the rise to the occasion is not just adversity of what writer's block, but it's life itself. How many dreams don't happen because life got in the way? Is your book not happening because life got in the way? Is writer's block just because life's getting in the way? Then you have to redefine your vision. You have to make sure you have a positive attitude. You have to have the passion, because if you don't have the heat or the passion, guess what? That oven aren't going to light up. You have to have the understanding and the right people to do it with. But you have to have all these things, too, because you want to know, so I'm going to tell you something about one person. How many of y'all know him? You said number one, right? Right? Drew Brees, right? In 2005, in the last game of the year, he was playing for San Diego Chargers at the time. He got hurt. And a lot of doctors said he's never going to play at a high level again. Never again. And thus, the team, the uh, San Diego Chargers, said, become a free agent. Bye. And of all the remaining teams in the NFL, only two showed interest in him. One was the Miami Dolphins, and they were actually coached by Nick Satan, I mean Saban, excuse me. Um, <laughs> uh, and he, was, he only wanted Drew if he was going to be on an incentive basis. So thank you, Nick. He was St. Nick to us because he didn't sign him. But the Saints said, you know what, I'll give you guaranteed money. I'll, I'm not going to take a chance. I'm going to believe in you. See the difference? Do you take a chance in somebody or do you believe in someone? Do you take a chance on your book or do you believe in your book? You see the difference? Now, Drew says this, and so he came, overcame adversity. He persevered. Anyone can see the adversity in a difficult situation, but it takes a stronger person to see the opportunity. If you find those words coming from God when you're on your knees, and you have that spiritual foundation, and you have the right team, the right coaching staff with you, life can't get in the way. Because God has given you those words. Think about the people that you will help with those words, the lives that you'll change. That's the way you make a difference. And that type of difference is significance. So, Drew's a Christian, so what does he have? He has the heart of the champion. Big difference. And you have the heart of the champion, too. So, in summary, vision. Attitude, love, understanding, and energy. Do you have all of these when you want to come to write your book? Vision, attitude, love, understanding, and energy. John Maxwell says, success is when I add value to myself. Significance is when I add value to others. Do you really feel inside of you that your book, the vision of what you have for your book, will make a difference for someone? And think about this. Sometimes it just has to make a difference for you. Sometimes the words we're going to write is not for the millions, but for the one. Because one can be extremely powerful. Mordecai Ham was a, a pastor back in the early 1900s. And he was the first televangelist that used multimedia, which was radio at the time. And he would actually do these, these revivals that would bring thousands and thousands of people to go. And these thousands and thousands of people, he would have an altar call and maybe a thousand, two thousand, three thousand professions of faith at one time. Now, one time when he was in uh, the Carolinas, he gave a presentation, and at that one, fittingly, only one person came up. One. Now, if you look at numbers, guess what? He was a failure that night. He didn't have the thousands and thousands, and his average of almost three thousand per revival. One. But you know who that one person was? Billy Graham. So sometimes we judge in the many 
when we should judge in the one. Because think about this. When you write a book, one person reads it at a time. If you sell a million, one person still reads it at a time. So decide if your book's going to be for millions, but more importantly, for one. And that one may be you. So, again, we put together Joyful Life Publishing to help you with that, to provide you the services that can happen. Let's talk a little bit about Joyful Life Publishing. When you choose a self-publishing partner, and it, it's two different ways. You can go traditional and you can go self-publishing. I went both ways. And as Tina sort of like alluded to in the beginning, my first book was in 1992. And it wound up being published in 94. And it was by Pelican Publishing. I was real excited about it, right? And a couple of years later, I get a check in the mail for $200. What is this for? So I called them up. And they said, oh, we sold the rights to Europe. And I went like, OK. And according to contract, we give you half. So they sold all my English version rights to Europe for $400. I got $200. Now move forward. It's Katrina. And I was hired as a consultant for a company. And we had to do some logistics. And I wound up going with the IT person for this company. And the IT person was from Russia and came to the United States to study at UNO. And he talked with that accent. And I tell you, when we were riding into New Orleans, remember the military presence at the, at the airport? I mean, he was like, oh, country, you know? And I went like, okay. So we're riding along, and a couple of days later, he turns to me and says, did you write a book about God and money? My book was called God's Money Back Guarantee. I said, yeah. He said, you're big in the old country. They're studying you in Sunday school. And we're like, who, who knew? Okay. I had nothing to do with any conspiracy with Russia. I just want to go on record. Okay. Uh, I am not an agent for Russia. <laughs> uh, I didn't, they did not help me get this gig today. Uh, but, anyway, but anyway, so when you're choosing with someone, make sure that they have your values. Very key. And not only your values, which in turn values, but also can they give you the vision, attitude, love, and understanding you need. Do they have your vision? Do they share your vision, I think is a better word. And do they share your faith? And prayerfully choose this about your partner. Control, cost, circulation, and commitment. Now, I've, I've had books going from the traditional publishing to self-publishing. My last one, ironically, I'm at this seminar held at the library on self-publishing. And lo and behold, the publisher, the owner of Pelican was there. And she remembered me, and she says, oh, what, you got anything going on? I said, yeah, but I've said I'm doing my own thing with the self-publishing. She said, well, that's great. What's your new book? I said, oh, it's, uh, it's called Christianomics. And he says, oh, it's very similar to the one we did 25 years ago. It's like a 25-year anniversary, isn't it? And we're like, yeah. She said, well, you, my dad loves it. He passed away, Melvin Calhoun. And she says, I want to do it. I'm like, wow, that's cool. I don't mind doing that because I got my own self-publishing, and I can, I can, it's good to have both. So lo and behold, I, that was like September of last year. They haven't done square th one thing with it yet because I lose control. Think about it. So now this book's been finished sitting there. I lost control because now it's on their timetable, not timetable. So always remember control, cost, circulation, and commitment. Those are the keys. Now, you need to make the decisions with your book based on what God's telling you. And you can't let anyone say that, well, there's, here's the package we got that fits all everybody package. Uh, you can't have, so what we do is you decide what support services you need. If you need a layout, fine. If you need coaching, fine. If you need editing, fine. All these things you select. No, you pay no hidden fees. And you select the various print and digital formats. Right now you can go digital, you can go any size book you can think of. But I'm actually finding out there's special sizes that you can do that actually, if you want to look like you're self-published or not self-published, there's certain fonts and different things. So I've learned some things that, that won't make it look that way. Um, the cost, you decide the cost of the book and you can't change it. Because the big key is that you can buy the book directly from the printer. My books, like I have one of them, some of them here, and I have one of them here called my popcorn book. Smell the Popcorn, 12 Life-Changing Secrets to Pop to the Top. That book cost me $3.20. I pay probably an average $0.50 cents for delivery. So for under $4, I have the book. 
So when you're speaking, because when you really sell your books is when you're speaking. And you want to have as little markup as possible. So you want to have, you know, because if you're going to sell it for 10 bucks, and then you're, you have to pay the publisher seven for it or, or eight, you're not making much. But if you come out four, that's a much better deal. That makes it worth it to speak. You buy your book at the printer, no markup. You hold the copyright protection. I think that's very important. You decide the global distribution and no minimum print. I can print one book, 100 or 1,000 books. So the key is walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. You need to be able to part of a team. And I'm not saying Joyful Life Publishing is for you. It may not be. But you need to find people who meet your goals. Let's talk about that, that story that I start off with. Remember, I, I messed, by, missed my goal by about that much? Well, let me tell you what happened after that. Well, my teammate became a hero by going that far for a touchdown <laughs> after I ran all those yards. But anyway, the score was back and forth, back and forth. I'm on the bench, right? Your new coach would put me on the bench, right? And we now just scored a touchdown to go ahead. There's like two minutes left. And this is a scrimmage game. And coach says, LaPree, get out there on the kickoff team. Really? <laughs> you know? Really? Yeah, I am. So I went out there. But before he huddles the team up and he says, watch for a trick play. Because I know they're going to do a trick play. Watch for it. Well, lo and behold, instead of lining up like this, like they normally were doing, this is what they did. I went, ha! Ah, something's up. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go after the guy who doesn't get the ball. So they kicked the ball off, and the guy over on this side caught it, started running with it, and my whole team goes there. Not me. I started going towards the other guy. So this guy is running with the ball, right, for the other team, and goes, ha ha, you're about to tackle me. Turns around and throws a backward lateral pass, and goes, probably going, oh, no. Because guess who's in the middle? Grabbed that ball and went in for another score. See, coach didn't give up on me. And you shouldn't give up on yourself. And a lot of people give up on it. I think it's easier to have a dream of writing the book. I can tell you, almost every person I meet, when I say I've written a book, they'll say, I have a book too. I think I have four of them, <laughs> all up here, <laughs> all up there. Great books. Sell a million. When are you going to start? I'm going to start soon. <sighs> They're giving up on themselves, huh? They have the same type of fantasy that I had about going to the NFL. So, tell you what, when I, was, when I went to school, first grade, I was this fat kid. I was huge. I was bullied. I had asthma pretty bad. And guess what? I stuttered. Could not speak. It was so bad that they took me out of regular class and put me in a special speech class three days a week. Well, that hurt my studies. I almost failed first and second grade. And I was bullied. I mean, everything made fun of. It was horrible. It was a terrible situation. And when I went to third grade, my teacher believed in me. She was my coach. She told me what I needed to do. And she took me out of speech class. She says, you don't need to go to a special class. What you need is a special teacher to teach you how special you are. And there's a lot of people here who have a special message to share, right? But guess what? Because that one teacher, and it was many more, don't get me wrong, and I talk about him in my book, or books, I should say. But since that time, this kid that stuttered nearly failed, was a board member of the National Speakers Association, and wrote these books. Now, we all know about who that, right? You know what I say is more important? This. What can you say after that? <laughs> Think about it. We had seven and nine seasons, three like times in a row. We did well last year. But this year, don't you want to say after, when it comes after that game in Atlanta, we want to say after that, I'm a champion? Yes. Now, when it comes to writing your book, can you say that? After that, I'm a champion? Yeah. So you know how it feels, don't you? And I can tell you, it seems great because you accomplished something. You made a difference. And when you get letters from people who you don't know thanking you for it, 
and where you can help people and you feel like, wow, in a small way I made a difference. Now, I, like I said, I don't get anything from Russia, but if there's one person whose life was turned around by that book, I did great, didn't I? So I believe that, think about this, what you really are looking at is when you don't write your book, you're missing the blessing. It's like God's coming to you and saying, hey, here's a book. And you're saying, oh, thank you. Now, when, when I was writing my, my uh, Smell the Popcorn book, I was having problems with the chapter on service, which was the 11th secret, and it's serve with compassion. I mean, I, 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 mean, I kept putting it off, finished the whole book except that one chapter. And one day, I went home and said, I'm going to do it, and from like 6 o'clock to midnight, I wrote and I hated it. Now, those of you who are writing books or have written books, you know that sometimes in the morning you wake up and God gives you an inspiration and you realize that you got to correct what you did and you run into the computer that morning and making changes, right? And you say, thank you. Well, I knew I needed big time changes on this because I hate it. I mean, I literally hated it, but it was words, it was done. Went to bed and I said, God, please, in the morning, give me inspiration because this is pretty bad. I'm exhausted, talk to you in the morning, good night. Put my head on the pillow and God said, follow the yellow brick road. And I said, great morning, remember, tired. Follow the yellow brick road. Good night, follow the yellow brick road. And we're like, okay, and I got up and I said, God, I'm exhausted, I can't do this. But with your strength, I can. And from that moment to about two in the morning, maybe 2.30, the words flowed. I mean, flowed. It was like, wow, uh, I can't type that fast. But the next day, and I had a, a job at the point, next day I wake up and I'm like, I'm gonna be exhausted, right? I was refreshed. Because you know what? I was doing it on his strength, not mine. So if you want to tune your book from a fantasy to reality, you're not gonna do it on your own. You're gonna do it on his strength. Because are you ready to say after that? So are you ready to empower the champion writer within you? The Bible says this, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Are you running toward your goal? Are you one yard short of your book? It's not a good feeling to be one yard short. But think about this, when it comes to salvation, we all fall one yard short, right? And that's why Jesus died on the cross with his arms one yard apart. Because he went the extra yard for us. So can't we go to the extra yard to produce the book he's given to us? Can't we thank him with that blessing? Let's think about this. Like I said, we're here to help if you want. It usually starts with an initial evaluation, which is $129. We're not trying to sell you anything, but I just want to tell you the basic thing. But for members of the Southern Christian Writer Guild, we only do $59. And our intent was, if you even join and do this, you're still less than the normal evaluation fee. Because we, we want to work in partnership with the Southern Christian Writers Guild. Think of it that way. So, in, 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 in closing, I want to tell you this. I believe everyone can be a champion because we all have the heart of the champion. But truthfully, will you be able to say, after that, I'm a champion writer? It's up to you. Go the extra yard and make a difference. Thank you.